Hi, this is Kim Shanley for Tennis Reach. Welcome to part five of our ongoing series, Zombies and Athletes of God. In part four, we discussed about how a bad paradigm can really stop all progress, whether it's in flying or whether it's in tennis. Today, I want to talk about what I call the ripple of power paradigm. The paradigm I think is best applied when we're talking about our power strokes in tennis. But before we do that, I want to refer back to the paradigm that most coaches use when they're talking about how energy and power flows in the human body. And it's something they call the kinetic chain, which is sort of a machine analogy of how the body works. The kinetic chain may sound scientific, but it's just a metaphor for trying to describe this process of energy flow inside the body, which we can't see or measure directly, except for the outcome and the force of our shot. But kinetic chain suggests a simple linear power mechanical process, like the chain moving one way around a gear or a conveyor belt carrying a load from one point to another at a uniform speed. There are several flaws with the kinetic chain idea, but I just want to focus on one, which is the overall basic analogy to how a machine works comparing it to how the body works. If we're pedaling a bicycle and moving a metal kinetic chain around a gear on our bike, the way to get the bike to travel faster is to pedal harder, more forcefully. And this works fairly well on a mechanical device like a bike. But a model that encourages us just to apply more force to an action is not a good model for athletic movements. That's the problem I have with the kinetic chain. For example, in tennis, just swinging harder uh, is not the solution to more force. Rather, we have to look, look at a sequential building of energy in our body and a sequential actions of various parts of our body. So this kinetic chain, which encourages us to apply force and more force in a uniform way, really is counterproductive to the way we truly produce energy in our body and power. For example, the initial movements for our power ground strokes, which is a slow initial turn back and just a slow building of this momentum that eventually ends up into a very fast whip drive kind of action at the end, or a serve starts in a very slow manner and then builds to a crescendo at the end. The kinetic chain also encourages this concept of uniform speed in our actions. So coaches often say, get ready quick, you know, take the racket back quick which then encourages a very quick release of the racket forward, which is not appropriate in tennis. That's not the most optimum way we hit. So it has a lot of unconscious uh, influence on us when we start thinking about this kinetic chain model. And this mechanical kinetic chain model also, I think, encourages us into local body actions with our arms, you know, not taking into account the whole body that has to be um, coordinated and integrated into a smooth action. And we saw this with Dinara Safina where her serve basically broke down to an arm serve through contact and the rest of her body power was cut off. Yes, she could move her arm very fast through the contact zone and actually create a very fast hit, but it did not have the proper spin and net clearance that we want on a serve. So you could say that Safina's serve was a case of applying too much force, too much power just with the arm and the hand, and not enough coordination with the entire body like we saw with Roger Federer's serve. In fact, our bodies are composed of a flexible skeleton that has various degrees of rotational functionality, along with layers of spiraling muscles that allow us to use our bodies in a kind of optimal rotational and spiraling actions we see in sports. And when we move skillfully, when one part of the body moves, all parts move, which is a much more complex and dynamic system than a linear kinetic chain or conveyor belt model. I believe the ripple of power paradigm has all these advantages over the kinetic chain model. Ripple of power conveys the major source of power, the legs, hips, and pelvis. It conveys, although not always, as we saw with Christian Ronaldo's reverse scissor kick in the air, where most of the power just comes from the scissoring legs in the air. 
Ripple of power also better describes how power in the human body is developed in sequential actions of parts of the body and the eventual convergence of multiple sources and streams of energy in a wave-like action. Finally, ripple of power describes how the big muscles of the body provide most of the power, enabling the hands to deliver either incredible power or a subtle touch. In the photo on the left, we see the classic karate man about to break some bricks with the chop of his hand. But this tremendous power, which is incredible in itself, isn't just a blunt mechanical blow. The karate master can vary what kind of power is transmitted in this strike. If you Google breaking the bottom brick on YouTube, you'll see a karate master break not the top brick in his strike, but just the bottom brick and leave the top brick intact. So the human body can manipulate its incredible power in all sorts of ways, far beyond what a machine can do. On the other hand, we see the incredible touch the body can demonstrate here with the Roger Federer forehand volley. No machine, no mechanical kinetic chain can explain both the power and variety of how energy and power are controlled by the human body. In terms of human movement, the best engineers have done to copy us is to build a robot that moves around as clumsily as a three-year-old baby. In other words, while engineers may have built a computer to beat the best chess player in a game of chess, they will never build a machine that plays basketball as well as Steph Curry or tennis as well as Roger Federer. This is part of the reason I think the ripple of power is a better and more complete description than kinetic chain. Ripple of power focuses on the way the body moves energy and power throughout from the ground up through this straightening of the major muscle groups in our legs up into a powerful hip and pelvis snap uh, up into the upper torso and into the final sometimes very subtle expression of power and the learning process of learning the ripple of power type movements is this a big circle a medium circle small circle no circle process that Josh Waiskin described in what we started with earlier it describes all the coordination and internal efficiency of the muscle and uh, skeletal system in producing this uh, very precise and incredible power flow, wave-like power flow in our body that eventually reaches the ball at contact. At the highest levels of skill, the athlete of God level, these actions of our internal body, if you will, become invisible. We just can't see them in the external motion captured by video and photographs. In this particular series that follows, we're going to take a close look at trying to capture the invisible with Novak Djokovic's forehand by zeroing in on something we usually don't focus on, which is the rear view and the lower part of the rear part of the body of Novak Djokovic. Before we look at the video, I wanted to peek inside the body for a moment. The legs, pelvis, and hips are the strongest part of the human body and the engine of power in most dynamic sports action. Here we see one of the largest muscles in the human body, the gluteus medius muscle. This muscle has three layers, and we only see the actions of the outer layer, the gluteus maximus. And here we have the rear view of Novak Djokovic setting the spring, preparing to move into the contact phase of his stroke. In the next slide, you see that both of Novak's legs straightening and his body rising on both of his toes. In the next slide, at contact with the ball, you see the scissoring action of Novak's hips, pelvis, and legs that we'll look at more closely in a moment. And then in the final two slides, Novak's follow through. But now let's examine this rear view of Novak's forehand more closely with special focus on the gluteus maximus this is the muscle closest to the surface of the body and the most visible. But remember, there are other layers of the gluteus medius muscle we saw earlier. And of course, many more muscle and ligament systems in play. But the focus on the buttocks in this pelvic hip snap does provide pretty compelling visual evidence of how powerful this ripple of power action is. And I also want to focus on the fact that this lower body movement is not a simple circular turn around an axis. 
as many players and coaches have this circular model as part of their swing paradigm. Here, looking at Novak's non-hitting arm, side, leg, and foot, we see he has set the spring for the release of his power. In the next slide, Novak's left leg is straightening, delivering the vertical energy of the legs into the pelvis hip area. And his feet and legs have begun a scissoring action where the left foot and leg are moving forward and the right foot and leg are moving backwards. In the next slide, as both of Novak's legs straighten further, the left and the right buttocks are pivoting and rotating at the same time. Novak's feet and legs, however, are scissoring and his left foot, as you can see, is shooting forward. The mistake players make here is that with a pure rotational swing model in their minds and bodies, they do execute a pure rotational movement of their entire lower body, opening up too soon with the shoulders and hips and diminishing the power of the pelvic hip snap. When we see a player who, quote, isn't getting his or her body into the shot, this is one of the primary reasons the pure rotational model is the wrong paradigm. The next slide shows Novak at contact, the most critical moment of the swing. Note how his left buttock muscle protrudes and rotates as Novak executes this pelvic hip snap. Again, the legs, pelvis, and hips are the largest and most powerful bone and muscle engine in the body. And here we clearly see how powerful that engine can be with the right technique of the pelvic hip snap. We also see the left leg and foot shooting forward while the right leg and foot shoot backwards. To say this in another way, the scissoring legs enable the pelvic hip snap to generate the rotational movement of the buttocks, which moves the energy and power from Novak's non-hitting side into his hitting side and into the power of a swing. You can also see by looking at the next frame that there is still plenty of power left in the pelvic hip snap as the left buttocks will rotate even more when we see the next slide. This is what players mean when they say saving the hit. The critical power pivot is being saved, being held back for just the right moment of release and delivery of power. Players who quote, pull out of the hit, often have already rotated too much, wasting the energy of this pivot. Of course, this is the same principle we covered earlier when looking at Roger Federer's somersaulting action on the serve. And to shuttle back and forth a few times for you to see this dynamic at the pivotal movement of contact. In this moment after contact, we see all the same dynamics of leg, hips, pelvis still in play. However, as we move further into the follow-through stage of the swing, well past contact, something different is happening with the legs and feet. As Novak completes his follow-through, his left and right foot do begin a much more circular rotation, as do the hips and shoulders. Why the change? Because the pelvic hip snap that provided the power for the shot is complete by this point. Novak's body is relaxing as the momentum from the follow-through carries Novak's body further around in a rotational manner, and he lands with his entire body facing left. Let's watch the animation of this sequence again a few times. In this video, we saw clear evidence of the power of this pelvic hip snap in the overall ripple of power paradigm. And we've come a long ways from when you're first examining this sort of lifeless, de-energized, non-hitting side of our body. And now we're beginning, I think, to more clearly see that we need both sides of the body to play their role to have a completely effective ripple of power action. We've also looked at the Josh Waiskin paradigm for learning, going from big circles to small circles to no circles, and how over time, as someone becomes skillful in something, these motions become smaller, more compact, more efficient. And we looked at how Novak Djokovic executes this ripple of power in his forehand. Again, these, the effort of these athletes of God tends to be invisible to the untrained eye, but we snuck around back and took a close look at so that we could see more of what's going on with this ripple of action paradigm. This process of learning going from big circles to no circles is the champion's pathway. But this process is not a secret. It's been detailed in dozens of recent books 
both tennis books like those of my master teacher, Dave Smith, as well as general sports books by Josh Waitzkin, Dan Millman, and others. A successful champion's journey depends on working on the right paradigm. Pete Sampras talks about this in his book, The Champion's Mind. He developed his game with his mind clearly fixed on building a championship level game for his talents. This meant suffering many losses in the junior ranks as he gave up his two-handed backhand and tested out his aggressive serve and volley style of play. It also means building a deep foundation of knowledge and skill, which is what we've been doing in the last several Tennis Reach videos focused on the ripple of power. Once we have a deeper understanding of the paradigm, we can see how it comes into play in all the power strokes, and we can see the same or very similar techniques applied. We don't all have to attempt to be athletes of God, but we should all want to get better at our sport, and understanding these paradigms at a deeper level will help. To further emphasize this idea of building a deep foundation of knowledge and skill, let me recount what Josh Waiskin says in his book when he was a national junior champion or aspiring one. He said he often ran into young, highly ranked players that had memorized opening moves, very complex moves, and would gain ranking points by implementing these memorized moves. And at first he had difficulty playing these players until he figured it out. And then once he got them past these opening moves into the middle or deeper part of the game, their knowledge skill fell apart and he easily beat them. I mentioned these stories from Pete Sampras's book and Josh Waysen's book about suffering losses at the early stage of learning. And this is a process that all champions have to go through. And it just emphasizes the importance of having a long range view and something beyond just achieving our current status and ranking. In order to become great, we have to do what Dan Millman says. We have to work below the waterline in other words, work on those invisible little improvements that don't show up right away. We'll look at these themes in the next videos. So whether your goal is just to be good or to go from good to great, I think you'll find them very valuable in your search.